Hello, my name is Christine Walgus, and I'm a meteorologist with the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Paducah, Kentucky. The topic of this talk will be on how to mentally prepare yourself before and during a severe weather event. We are finding out as time goes on that many people know what a tornado warning is and know what to do in the event of a tornado. The main reasons for tornado deaths are that people are choosing not to respond to the warning and not preparing for an event. This talk will give you much to think about and hopefully give you insight on how to make better decisions in the future. I recently found a paper written by National Weather Service meteorologists back in 1974, and one of the chapters talked about warnings and how people responded to them. One sentence stated, quote, a more real problem in most wings is to get people to respond, end quote. It is 2013, and it appears as though some things haven't changed in nearly 40 years. I also found this recent tweet from Marshall Shepard, a professor from the University of Georgia, which conveys the same sentiment. His statement basically says that the signs and warnings are solid, but the way people interpret and respond to the warnings needs some work. Here are some tornado statistics that really highlight how unprecedented the year 2011 was for tornado records. This one year really set the stage for a more rigorous look at tornado death prevention. The Joplin EF5 tornado, which occurred on May 22, 2011, was the seventh deadliest tornado of all time, with 158 deaths. If you look at this first column of statistics, you will notice that the other top six deadliest tornadoes of all time occurred a long, long time ago. The last time a tornado killed over 100 people was back in 1953 in Flint, Michigan. 2011 was also the second deadliest year for tornadoes, being trumped only by the year 1925 when the tri-state tornado occurred. But again, take a look at all the other years listed there. They were all a long time ago. The most recent year we had a death toll like that was in 1974, when 366 people lost their lives in the super outbreak. Looking at deaths in the United States by year, you can clearly see how 2011 stands out. On April 27, 2011, we had 319 deaths on that one day. So what happened? Why were there so many deaths? We are going to look at some of the reasons why this might have happened. The profound death toll of 2011 really had the experts scratching their heads. Tornado historian Tom Grizzulis was quoted as saying, With warnings and Doppler radar, there was a lot of feeling that we were done with this stuff, meaning tornado deaths. With many of the tornado outbreaks in 2011, forecasts were made days in advance of this threat, and timely warnings were issued so there was plenty of advance notice that severe weather was going to strike. Harold Brooks, a research meteorologist, stated, however, that something didn't work the way we'd like it to. Dr. Erwin Ridliner, the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, said, the fundamental characteristic of a major disaster is that there's going to be loss. What we have to do is find ways to minimize that loss. Being prepared and knowing how to respond is key. Both before a severe weather event and during a severe weather event, we as humans will have a lot of information to process. How we process it and how we act on or make decisions with that information can be key to our survival. One of the major factors in dealing with an event is personalizing the threat. Some people have what we call optimism or normalcy bias. People that have this bias are always going to underestimate the likelihood of a negative event. So they will say things such as, I don't believe there will be a tornado, or the tornado won't strike here, it will touch down someplace else. Sometimes, even though the existence and time of a danger can be forecast, it is difficult for some people to accept those messages and believe that the event is possible. People will take advantage and grab a hold of any vagueness or ambiguity in the warning so that they can interpret the situation as optimistically as possible. Think about how you view the possibility of tornadoes hitting your neighborhood. People usually have difficulty reacting to something that they have not experienced before. Most people would rather believe they are safe than in danger. 
even when the warning is as free of ambiguity as possible, and the facts are there, there are difficulties presented by the normalcy bias. People will search for more information that will confirm, deny, or clarify the message, and then seek further confirmation of the credibility and the urgency of the message. People who are at home will often check to see what action their neighbors are taking, for example. Or people who are at work or school will generally wait for some cues from the organization itself. However, if they cannot find more information that satisfies that need for confirmation, the tendency will be to interpret the situation as normal and not take action. Remember that hesitation to reacting to a warning can obviously increase your odds of becoming a tornado statistic. For some people, hearing the sirens or their no weather radio alerting is enough to take action immediately. However, many people have to gain confirmation of the threat through a second or third source before they trust that there is a threat and believe their location will be impacted. Some people will turn on the TV, turn up the radio, or call someone they know. Others may seek information from Facebook, Twitter, and text messages, or visit a website. Unfortunately, response to warnings is not a simple process. It is a complex, multifaceted process that will be different for everyone. You will be asking yourself many questions, starting out with, what is my perception of the risk? You will want to know how bad it is going to be. Where exactly is a tornado going to strike, and when? And possibly you may want to gain visual confirmation of that tornado before you take action. You will also make your own personal observations of the situation and may say things like, well, this doesn't look too bad yet. All of this activity takes time and could result in an increased chance for death. If you can receive many forms of information quickly enough, your response time will likely increase, allowing for a greater chance for survival. It is when there is too much time in between these information sources that causes problems. The problem lies in the fact that a lot of people need visual confirmation of the tornado and base their actions of what they see. Many people may wait until they see debris or see the actual tornado before acting. This was the case down in Alabama and Mississippi during the tornado outbreak there in April of 2011. Interviews were, were done with survivors, and the vast majority of people claimed that what ultimately made them go to their shelter was actually seeing debris or the tornado itself. They had prior knowledge of the event and the warning and knew what to expect, but waited until the moment of seeing the tornado before taking action. Other outside factors will add to your decision-making process and either help to confirm or deny the threat. By examining how the people around you are reacting, this may alter how you react. For instance, you might be tuning into your favorite on-air meteorologist and seeking out the level of threat by their mannerisms and how they are talking about the event. You may also look around and study the people around you to see how they are all responding or not responding. And lastly, you may be given suggestions on what to do from those who are close to you. There will be other factors that will be going through your mind as you go through the process of personalizing that threat and taking action. Your past experiences with tornadoes can have a profound impact on how you respond. If you've been through one before, you will be more apt to act on the warning than someone who has not. Complacency also plays a huge role in the response to warnings. Many people use the high false alarm reasoning for not responding to a warning. People will say, so many warnings and nothing ever happens. Why should I bother to take shelter? Or people will say that the sirens go off too often and they end up ignoring them. However, there are two, two schools of thought on this. In looking through forums on the internet on weather, I've seen a few quotes. The first one that I came across said, I can't tell you how many warnings I get that never pan out. I understand they have to issue the warning, but maybe a little too much. In contrast to that, there's this quote, hey, better safe than sorry. If they don't say anything and there is a tornado, people will cry about that too. 13 warnings, but no tornadoes 
is better than no warnings and one tornado for me. If I choose to ignore the warnings, then it's my fault. So there will continue to be a concern of overwarning, and we as the National Weather Service are going to try to take steps to mitigate this in the future. We also have something called folk science. This is the belief that some land feature will protect people from tornadoes, such as that river or hill will protect me from a tornado. However, it's been proven time and time again that tornadoes know no boundaries and will travel across rivers, lakes, hills, and cities with no difficulties. Lastly, in some cases, making the choice to respond to a warning and take action can have serious implications, such as a plant shutting down and losing revenue. Then there are issues with personal preparedness and response. If you do not have plans on what to do, this may cause panic in some people. So you need to ask yourself, do I know what to do, where to go, and where not to go? Many people have trouble trying to figure out when exactly to seek shelter, and some wait until it's too late. Always assess your own personal safety and seek shelter when you feel your personal safety is being threatened. You will also have to figure out how long it will take you to get to your shelter. Are you just going to your basement, or do you have to travel down the street to a friend's house? In addition, many people do not pay attention to the information that is provided in the body of the actual tornado warning. We do our best to insert important, pertinent information in our warnings so you can make the best decision possible. Personal emotions also play a huge role in survival. If you are someone who panics easily or develops major anxiety when severe weather threatens, then your emotions will likely alter your actions. You will either become distracted by your emotions and that does not allow you to think clearly. Believe it or not, claustrophobia can also cause issues as well. There is a story out of Alabama from the tornadoes in 2011 where a woman was so claustrophobic that she refused to get into shelter with the rest of her colleagues and decided to take her chances and ended up a fatality. There are a lot of people that need visual confirmation that a tornado is actually bearing down on them and simply will not take any protective actions until they see the whites of its eyes. However, sometimes a tornado is enshrouded in rain and it's hardly visible or not visible at all, as you see in this picture on the right. Of course, nighttime tornadoes will be nearly impossible to see. A large wedge type tornado or a tornado that has a large debris cloud will also not look like a typical tornado. Therefore, sometimes if you decide to wait until you actually see the tornado, it might be too late. Would you recognize this image as a tornado? Believe it or not, this is a picture of the Joplin EF5 tornado. There are other factors besides the human factors we talked about that go into responding and reacting to a warning. Geography and population play a role in increased chances for fatalities. The U.S. population has more than doubled since, since 1950. We also have urban sprawl and expanding suburbs. The fact is, the more people you have and the higher concentrations of people in one spot will increase your chances for fatalities. There have been many cases in which just a slight change in the tornado's path would have substantially increased the number of fatalities. The strength of the winds in a tornado also has a profound effect on your chances for survival. Obviously, the stronger the winds, the greater the chances for death. Only 1% of all tornadoes are in the EF4 to EF5 category, which is violent tornadoes. But tornadoes of this caliber account for 67% of all deaths. What day of the week and what time of day the tornado occurs also has an effect on how people may become injured or killed. More people are traveling during certain periods of the week or times of day. Some are less likely to monitor the weather or even have, have adequate shelter depending on where they are on a particular day. Nighttime tornadoes, for example, pose one of the greatest threats since most people are sleeping at night and not aware of the potential tornado warning unless they have a way to receive the warning. Or think about Sunday church services, a graduation ceremony, a county fair, or a sporting event. 
you are going to have a greater chance for fatalities in these cases simply due to the concentrated amount of people, many of whom may not be aware of the tornado warning because they are preoccupied with that event or may be unfamiliar with their surroundings. Tornadoes that strike later in the day on a weeknight may result in less deaths simply because people are settled in for the night and are less preoccupied with daily tasks. The type of structure you are in, the strength of that building, and other characteristics of that building have a lot to do with survival. Whether you take shelter in a mobile home versus a stick-built home is one issue. Stick-built homes can withstand more wind than a mobile home. This graphic shows the location of the 52 deaths that have occurred with tornadoes across our region from 1996 through October 2013. Keep in mind that 85% of all these deaths occurred with tornadoes that have happened at night. One unpredictable factor that we have to deal with is how quickly a tornado actually develops. Tornadoes can sometimes develop very quickly and this will obviously shorten your reaction time. Using the Joplin tornado as an example, even though residents of Joplin had over 20 minutes of warning, still so many people died. One of the problems was that this tornado formed very quickly. Prior to the issuance of the warning, the forecasters on duty had no other reports of tornadoes, just a few funnel cloud reports. Therefore, the storm had no history of producing damage, so the warning went out as a Doppler radar indicated tornado. When this tornado touched down just west of Joplin, it only took a few minutes for it to become rapidly violent and become EF4 to EF5 in strength. This left little time for people to understand how bad this situation really was. Another item to think about is that tornadoes are erratic and do not always follow a straight line. This is something we are not always going to be able to forecast. That is why a tornado warning sometimes encompasses as much real estate as it does to err on the side of caution and to account for possible erratic behavior. Case in point, the El Reno tornado in May 2013. In this graphic, you can clearly see how the track was initially southeast and then it became more easterly and toward the end of its life, it abruptly shifted to the northeast. You also have to remind yourself how small an event a tornado really is. Looking at this Associated Press photo from the Moore, Oklahoma EF5 tornado that occurred in May 2013, you can see that the serious damage impacted in an area about four or five houses wide, leaving other houses in the neighborhood completely untouched. A smaller tornado would impact an even smaller area. So while you may be thinking to yourself how it never hits your house, well, it might have hit just a few blocks away. The key to being prepared is knowledge and keeping good situation awareness. Keep weather in the forefront of your mind. Think about your plans for the day. What's the weather forecast? Are severe storms possible? Could your plans be altered if bad weather strikes? Do you know how and where to receive timely updates? Do you understand all the available technology and how to use it? Do you have a plan? Do you know what to do and how to react? Can you think fast and make the best decision possible and respond? Remember that you have to be open to the possibility of an event before you can even try to plan for it. Be adaptable and open. Your comfort zone can change rapidly. These days, there are many ways to obtain information. Explore the ones listed on the screen and find out what works best for you and your family and try to look at as many avenues as possible to be prepared. Remember, redundancy is the key. Here are some tornado safety rules that everyone should know. One of the keys to, is to know beforehand what your shelter will be and where. One of the basic shelters to seek out is a sturdy building. A basement or underground shelter is best. However, many people have survived violent tornadoes in an above ground man-made shelter. Once inside a building or home, the best place to be is on the lowest floor and in a small interior room, such as a closet, bathroom, or hallway. The key is to put as many walls between you and the outside. Stay away from windows and glass. 
as well as places with high ceilings, such as large big box stores like Lowe's or Walmart. Try to cover yourself with blankets and pillows. Wear a helmet and get underneath something sturdy if possible. This is all done to protect yourself from flying debris that may impale you or fall on top of you. Always try to carry your cell phone with you so that you will be able to monitor the weather and let others know where you are. Please visit the website listed on the screen for more information on tornado safety. We realize that the NOAA weather radio is becoming more of an alarm than your single source of weather information. However, many people still do not have a weather radio and many people who do have them simply turn them off. One of the main complaints about the weather radio is that it alarms too much. One of the main reasons for this is the type of weather radio you own. Some of the less expensive types of weather radios will not have what is called the same or specific area message encoding. NOAA weather radio receivers without the same capability will alert for emergencies anywhere within the coverage area of the transmitter, typically several counties, even though the emergency could be well away from the listener. NOAA weather radios with the same capability use digital coding to automatically activate for specific weather or emergency conditions for the specific county or counties that you choose. You program your weather radio for just the county or counties and types of weather you wish. Your receiver will then automatically alert you of only the weather and other emergencies in areas you programmed. Remember that a weather radio that is turned off will not do what it's designed to do, and that's to save lives. I wanted to address and shed some light on a recent tweet I saw that stated, why haven't weather forecasts and warnings improved so people don't die in tornadoes? The National Weather Service has come a long way in science, forecasting, and technology in the past 20 years, and there has definitely been an uptick in information that is sent out these days. However, there will continue to be limitations with the science of meteorology and technology, and thus there will still be missed forecasts and warnings once in a while. That being said, there is a lot of information provided by the National Weather Service that people can utilize to make preparations in their daily lives. We have definitely gone beyond the usual seven-day forecast and now push information via social media outlets such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, along with a bunch of information available on our website, such as graphical forecasts. By simply going to our website with the address listed here on the screen, you can obtain a wealth of information. By clicking on the map where you live, you will get a detailed seven-day forecast, along with any weather watches, warnings, or advisories for your area. Weather Story will give you a glimpse of the weather forecast as well. Short-term Graphicasts will give you the forecast for the next few hours. Make sure to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages, along with YouTube. By clicking on this link labeled Outlooks, you will gain knowledge of severe weather and flooding, as well as winter weather forecasts. During ongoing survey weather or winter weather, you can click on this banner toward the middle of the page for a one-stop shopping web website with loads of information. The National Weather Service does all it can to add important and pertinent information into our warnings. It is important to take a minute to read what the warning says so that you can make better decisions. First and foremost, you have to know what county you live in since the warnings are based on counties. In addition, the most important information is located in the basis statement, or the third bullet. This is the part of the warning that will tell you where the storm is located and which way it's moving at the time of warning issuance. The National Weather Service has also implemented something called impact-based warnings. One of the changes with impact-based warnings is that you will clearly see what the expected hazard, source, and impact will be. We will also list locations that are included in the warning, but it's very important that you take a look at the actual visual graphic of the warning itself so you can know immediately whether or not you're in the warning polygon. Another way to gain insight on the severity of the event is by glancing at the bottom of the warning. There are a couple of tags that will be appended to the warning. One is the tornado tag and the other is the tornado damage threat tag. These tags will give you more information about the possible tornadic event. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation. I hope that if nothing else, you can sit back and reflect on some of the information presented here 
and make some changes for yourself and those you care about. Together, we can make a difference and hopefully prevent or at least lessen the amount of deaths from tornadoes in the future. If you have any questions at all or comments, please email me at the email address listed here. Thank you for your time.